What up, A Push people? Today we are going to take a look at period two in the A Push curriculum. It goes from 1607, the founding of Jamestown, all the way to 1754, which is the beginning of the French and Indian War. And we're going to knock this out real quick, give you all the basics, just the nitty gritty. So some big ideas for you for period two that you should keep in mind is one, there were similarities and differences between the Spanish, the French, the English, and Dutch colonization efforts of North America. These four countries are going to be the four key ones, and there's going to be similarities and differences between them. The second point is the English colonies were largely allowed to govern their own affairs, and oftentimes ignored English mercantile laws. Prior to 1754, historians called this period a period of solitary neglect. For this period, the colonies are going to be growing, the 13 colonies are going to be establishing themselves, and they're going to be kind of left alone from England. Third point, Native Americans and Europeans engaged in a variety of complex relationships. Now, isn't that a vague statement? We're going to take a look at that a little bit more closely in a moment. And then finally, the horrible institution of slavery developed in the colonies during this time. So let's get started. You know, important point, different societies emerged as Europeans and American Indians maneuvered and fought for dominance, control, and security in North America. And if you take a look at that map, you have all these different Native American cultures and societies that had been around for a long period of time before contact. And then you have all these European countries coming in. And these countries and the different societies that are going to emerge are going to do so. These different patterns of colonization are going to occur because of the different goals of the Spanish, the French, the English, the Dutch, the different cultures, and then finally, the different environments in which they settle. They're going to inhabit different parts of the continent, and as a result, the societies are going to be very different and distinct from one another. Another important point is Spain is going to seek to establish tight control over the process of colonization in the Western Hemisphere and will attempt to convert and exploit the native population. So Spain is going to take over that orangish color and when it comes to the modern day United States, you know, Florida into the Southwest, Arizona, California, it's going to be secondary to their empire over here in what is today Mexico and down in Peru and Cuba. That's where the gold and the silver, the Aztecs, the Incas, where they conquered them. A couple of quick things to remember. Columbus comes in 1492. You have the beginnings of the Columbian Exchange. They divide the New World up with the Treaty of Tordesillas between Spain and Portugal. You have some Spanish conquistadors who are running up into different areas of Florida and modern-day Arizona looking for riches and wealth like they found amongst the Incas and the Aztecs. You have the development of the encomienda system where you basically have native workers who are basically slaves doing the labor. In 1565, the first permanent European settlement in North America is established by Spain with St. Augustine. You have Spain governing their empire under a mercantilist principles. All that gold and silver is being sent back to Spain, the mother country. Spanish missionaries are going to play a key role in the settlement of the Spanish Empire, especially New Spain up in the northern part of the frontier region. Uh, spreading Catholicism. Spain's going to have a unique relationship with native people. You are going to have the rise of a mestizo group of people, mixed race people, because there's going to be intermarriage amongst Spanish and native people. And then finally, of course, not everything's going to go well, because in 1680 you'll have Pueblo's Revolt, where the native people in what is today New Mexico will revolt against Spanish rule. So those are a few things about Spanish colonization. What about the French? If you look at the map, France is really doing well. All that green stuff, New France, a lot of territory. The Dutch are also here, if you take a look closely, in what is today New York. That purple region was known as New Netherlands. And France and Dutch are going to share something in common because relatively few Europeans are going to come over, mainly med, and they're going to be looking for trade alliances with the native people, mainly with regard to the fur trade. 
And as a result of this very few people coming over, and most of them being men, intermarriage amongst native people and French and Dutch settlers will be much more common than it will be elsewhere in the colonization story. A couple things about France you should know for a quick study guide. Samuel de Champlain, the father of New France, 1608, establishes Quebec. You have the French Huguenots and Catholic Jesuit missionaries who are coming over, very often trying to convert native people. You have the fur trading economy, especially beaver fur, and as a result, you have very close relationship with the natives, the Huron Alliance, for instance, or the Algonquin people, the native tribes, and the French are going to forge this alliance. You know, you have these guys, the Baudet de Blue. I totally mispronounced that on purpose. But these are the French fur traders who are fiercely independent being a part of this colonization process. In terms of government, France isn't going to have any kind of democratic government principles. No trial by jury, no representative assemblies like you'll see in the English colonies. The Dutch, they're also establishing colonies in what is today New York, Albany, New York area. This is, of course, run by the Dutch West India Company. It's a company town. New Amsterdam is the name. And once again, it's going to be a very diverse colony. For instance, in New Amsterdam, in New Netherlands, the majority of the people are not even going to be Dutch. And as a result, it's going to be very difficult for Holland to keep its colony when English swoops in, I think, in like 1664. And keep this in mind, the Beaver Wars will take place between the Dutch and their French rivals. More on that in just a moment. Now, the English colonies were very different from their rivals, especially Spain and France. And the reason for the difference is, one, there's a large number of men and women who come over. In some cases, first it's men coming over, but slowly women start making up a big percent of the population. They're going to establish permanent economic settlements mainly agricultural settlements, whereas the Spanish and the French are moving around much more, large numbers, permanent settlements, and another key point is a very hostile relationship with the native people. Another key point about the British, you are going to have the, the regional differences existing between the British colonies. And they're divided up into three kind of categories, sometimes four. You have the New England colonies, the Northern colonies, the Middle colonies, and the pinkish color. And then the southern colonies, sometimes divided up into the Chesapeake, whereas Virginia and Maryland, and then the lower south, South Carolina and Georgia. Um, reasons for the differences are important that you know. One, who came? You know, depending upon who came and why they came, this kind of creates different societies. And we'll take a look at that a little bit more closely in just a second. And finally, environmental and geographic factors, the climate, the natural resources that are that are available to them, all of these things will cause regional differences. For instance, the New England colonies very much developed based upon who came and the reason they're coming, the motives are Puritan uh, religious motives. You know, you have the pilgrims with the Mayflower Compact. William Bradford are the first ones in the area. They established the first settlement, followed by John Winthrop and the Massachusetts Bay Company and his, you know, his goal of a city upon a hill. So in the New England region, religion is going to play a key role close-knit, homogenous society, everything's very similar. You have this religious motives. Not everyone was, was Puritan, but it was the kind of core of the early period of the New England colonies. You have this scene, of course, in the town hall meetings where all adult male church-going members had a huge amount of power. Harvard University is established in 1636 as a place to train ministers in the colony. Now, However, there is some examples of how this was not exactly a close-knit, homogenous society. Uh, for example, Roger Williams was banished for his ideas of separation of church and state, and eventually he goes off and founds the colony of Rhode Island, and Hutchinson gets into disagreements with the colonial leadership. You have the Salem Witch Trials in 1692, and the Halfway Covenant, as more and more of the Puritans uh, were, were becoming less and less committed to the religious mission of the colony. So these are all great examples of how the colony had to adjust and was challenged. And then finally, the economy of the New England area 
is a mixed economy, everything from fishing to shipbuilding to wood uh, collection. So it's a mixed economy, not a very good spot for big agriculture because of the cold, rocky climate. Another key point, while they're going there for religious freedom, many of them, they are not tolerant of people who are different than their own religious beliefs. So, case in point, Roger Williams gets kicked out of the colony. The middle of colonies are also a region that's very unique and distinct. They are very diverse demographically. There's a mixture of people coming over, large number of families in places like Pennsylvania. There's also a great degree of religious diversity. For instance, the Quakers in Pennsylvania, William Penn, his holy experiment where he is going to give a great degree of religious freedom to all different religions, a great degree of freedom for women. Um, ethnic diversity can be seen, for instance, in New York. You're going to have the Dutch presence. It is the Dutch who are there first, and then England takes over their colony and renames it New York. You're going to have a lot of German and Scots-Irish immigrants coming to places like Pennsylvania, immigrating to these colonies. And then finally, the economy is a very mixed economy, um, a lot of it based upon uh, wheat growing, and it's going to be referred to as the breadbasket of the colonies. Another area is the Chesapeake Colony. We're dealing with Virginia and Maryland in this case, in the Chesapeake Bay region, but sometimes North Carolina gets lumped into this. Um, if you take a look at Virginia, for example, you will see the economic motives of the colonization of this area. You have people like uh, John Smith, 1607, the establishment of Jamestown. The Virginia Company of London plays a key role in this. You have this starving time where the people are, are struggling. They're not making any money. They're not accustomed to working. John Smith comes in, gives them a lot of discipline, gets them into shape. And then a guy by the name of John Rolfe introduces the cultivation of tobacco, which gives rise to the plantation economy. And of course, at first it is the headright system, indentured servants, but over time, because of the various social and political and racial issues going on in the colony, Bacon's Rebellion happens in 1676, leading to a transition to African chattel slavery. In terms of uh, uniqueness, Maryland's kind of a, a unique case study for religion as well as this area. You have Lord Baltimore, and he establishes the colony as a Catholic refuge uh, and does pact pass the Act of Religious Toleration. Of course, this only applies to Christians. So if you're Jewish or Muslim, no toleration for you. But the Chesapeake colonies and North Carolina are going to be characterized by their cultivation of tobacco and its export. Finally, the southern colonies, which includes South Carolina, sometimes North Carolina, but kind of more similar to Virginia and Georgia. And what a lot of people don't realize also is the fact that you're dealing with the West Indies. England had colonies in the West Indies, for instance, Jamaica and Barbados. Sugar plantations are going to be key in that area. Some, some things about the southern colonies, slave labor cash crop economies. In South Carolina and Georgia, it's going to be rice and to a lesser extent indigo, but it's going to be cash crops, plantation economy, and in many cases, uh, for instance, in South Carolina and in Jamaica and Barbados, the majority of the population will be slave labor. Ethnic diversity of the colonies, things you should know about, you know, for instance, like I just said, South Carolina, there is a mixture of English immigrants and African people in the region. In South Carolina, you have a majority slave population. Over here in New England with the yellow arrow, you're going to have a mixture of people. You have Scots-Irish coming in, but once again, the major majority are going to be Puritans. And then once again, in Pennsylvania, you're going to see that diversity in the colonies. You have the Germans, you have Scots-Irish, you have English. English. So the colonies are going to be, from the start, a melting pot of people, not all English. In terms of economic diversity, I already mentioned it, but of course you have the rice production over here, you have the mixed economy over here in the north, and then in the middle colonies, the breadbasket growing things like wheat and other agricultural products. Something that you need to know, and it's really important that you know about it, is the fact that over time you're going to get the 
regional differences diminishing. And these colonies are going to share some colonial identity traits. One of them is there is going to be a development of religious freedom and diversity. You saw this in some of the colonies already. Rhode Island with Roger Williams establishing the separation of church and state. Pennsylvania, William Penn and the Quakers, this religious toleration for all different groups of people. Remember, the Quakers were willing to negotiate and buy the land for the native people, whereas that didn't happen in other colonies. In Maryland, you have this haven for Catholics and the act of religious toleration, of course, not extended to all religions, just the Christians. And, of course, a big moment in colonial identity is the First Great Awakening. In the 1730s, you get people like Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, George Whitefield. And this really promotes religious diversity in the colonies. It promotes challenging authority, this kind of democratization of religion, which is all going to lead to the development of religious freedom and diversity. However, this was not a reality in all of the colonies. So kind of point out when you're studying where did this occur and where did it not occur. This is the development, not the end of colonial identity. Political, you have the development of democratic institutions. For example, in 1620, the Mayflower Compact is one of the earliest examples of colonial self-government. These individuals are signing this document and pledging themselves to this greater cause. In the New England colonies, I mentioned it already, but the town hall meetings gives a great degree of political uh, power to adult male church members. Um, in Virginia, in 1619, you have the House of Burgess, which is the first representative assembly in North America. So, of course, this is dominated by wealthy, rich planters, but once again, it is the development of democratic institutions. Pennsylvania, once again, elected representative assemblies. Most of the colonies had trial by jury and the impact of Enlightenment ideas. As ideas from John Locke and Rousseau are coming over to the colonies, this, this idea of you know natural rights and other things are taking root. However, most colonists are excluded from politics. This is the gradual development of democratic ideas. So very often, white males without property are excluded. Obviously, and unfortunately, African Americans are excluded, women, Native Americans, so understand the development of democratic institutions. And then finally, all of the colonies are going to kind of have Anglicization of their institutions. They're going to develop political systems that are based upon English models, English legal traditions, commercial relationship with England, Enlightenment ideas, religious influence, and connections to the Atlantic world, including the rest of Europe. Important point, as the colonies developed, their interests oftentimes conflicted with the goals and interests of the mother country. This led to growing mistrust between the colonies in England. So during this time, these colonies are developing, but not always are their interests going to align with the interest of England. And of course, kind of a moment of a push foreshadowing, things are about to go down in 1754 as the colonies grow and move west in the Ohio Valley, you're going to have a conflict with France, which will lead to the French and Indian War. Early conflict with England, a couple things to keep in mind. Mercantilist laws are going to attempt to restrict the economic activity of the colonies, most famously the Navigation Acts, which basically say you can only trade with England, you had to go to English ships, you had to go to English ports, and only some goods are enumerated, meaning only could trade with England. But many colonies are going to ignore these laws by smuggling and trade with England's rivals. You're going to have acts such as the Molasses Act and the Hat Act, which put taxes on the colonies, and they were intended to promote and protect British economic interest, and very often the colonies are going to be resentful of these. You're going to have the Dominion of New England established in 1686, which is going to attempt to increase royal control over the colonies. Uh, New England colonies, New York, New Jersey. Sir Edmund Andros is going to be put in charge of this. And ultimately, this will fail following the Glorious Revolution. And then, last but not least, as the colonies are moving west into territory that is disputed, the Ohio Valley, you are going to have attempts 
and this is really in period three, where the English are going to try to stop colonial or restrict colonial expansion with the proclamation of 1763. All right, a few more things to make you a push smart. Interactions with European settlers caused tremendous demographic and cultural changes amongst Native American and African communities. So this contact that starts in 1492 is going to have huge consequences for a variety of continents and groups of people. Spain and France tended to attempt to accommodate some aspects of Native American culture. So you're going to have a very different relationship between Spain and France and the Native American communities they interact with than you are going to have with the British, which leaves me to point three. English colonization tended to reinforce their own worldviews on land and gender roles. So what does all this mean? Well, one, the British American system of slavery developed out of the economic, demographic, and geographic characteristics of the British controlled regions of the New World. Translation, you're going to have a lack of racial mixing in the English colonies. There's going to be a very rigid racial hierarchy in the British colonies. There's going to be white British colonists and there's going to be African people brought in. Whereas in Spanish colonies, you have the emergence of mestizo and mulatto people. This isn't going to happen amongst the English colonists. In fact, by 1619, you're going to have African chattel slavery emerging in the colony of Jamestown and spreading to others. And it is going to be the result of there being lots of land, a shortage of indentured servants to do the work, and the fact that they cannot enslave the native people because they're not immune to the diseases and they're able to run away out into the frontier. And there is a growing demand for European goods or colonial goods, which contributes to this reliance on slavery. There's also a strong belief in British racial and cultural superiority, which leads eventually to the system of slavery to be one in which African people are enslaved for life. Um, this is also going to lead the British colonists to want to get rid of the native people. There is no need for them as there is in the Spanish or the French colonies in North America and you're going to have a series of wars take place as a result. And then finally African people are going to develop overt and covert ways of trying to resist the institution of slavery. Things like running away or working slower are all methods that could be utilized. And here's the big idea here, and it's really important. This is a lot of stuff about, uh, about this on the A-Push exam. European colonization efforts in North America stimulated intercultural contact and intensified conflict between the various groups of colonizers and native peoples. So what you're going to see over and over again is examples of this. For instance, the New England colonies, make sure you know about the Pequot War in 1636-37 where Native Americans are resisting and ultimately defeated. King Philip's War in the New England colonies, which ends in 1676 and marks the kind of final resistance of Native people in the New England area. In the Chesapeake colonies, you see the Anglo-Powhatan Wars, which take place a series of wars from 1610 to the 1640s, where the colonists in Jamestown in Virginia are resisting and crushing the native uh, people led by Powhatan. You have Bacon's Rebellion, which is not uh, as simple as colonizers versus native, but you have the frontiersmen, the backcountry frontiersmen led by Nathaniel Bacon, rebelling against the Tidewater elite, which ultimately leads to the growth of slavery in the colonies. In the southern colonies in 1739, you have the Stono Rebellion in South Carolina, where you have slaves rebelling, trying to get to Spanish Florida, and ultimately it is crushed and further restrictions are placed on slaves throughout the colonies. In the Spanish colony, you have the Pueblo Revolt, where in 1680, the Pueblo Indians revolt, and after that point, the Spanish have to accommodate and relax some of their demands placed upon the native people, because they're outnumbered by the native people, unlike in the British colonies. And even in the French and the Dutch colonies, you have the Beaver Wars in the mid-17th century, where you have the French and their native homies 
fighting the Dutch and their native friends, the Iroquois. So all of these are examples of intercultural contact and conflict that results. In fact, even amongst the Native Americans, the intensity and the destructiveness will increase amongst those groups because they're they got guns now. The trade with the Europeans, uh, there was always intertribal warfare, but it just accelerates and that can be seen very famously in the beaver wars where you have the Iroquois fighting the Huron tribe uh, traditional rivals but now they got guns from France and the Netherlands all right we made it period two a push reviewed in about 25 minutes I hope it was helpful these are all about the big ideas go back and study the little stuff and before we close out today, I want to give a big shout out to all my APUSH students out in Los Angeles at a Title I school. Most of us are poor folk, first AP class in some cases. We all take the test, and yet we're beasted it every single year with an average of over 90% pass rate most years. If you're joining us, we hope you join the movement and pass as well. And subscribe to the channel, tell your friends, and keep on studying. Peace out, y'all.